Hi, this is number five, five, six. I don't even know what this is at this point. In uh, these sorts of events that we do, boring through boring, nothing is boring. What is going to happen is that we are going to throw out, throw up, throw up. Both of those are bad phrases. Some topics that we typically find boring, in fact, terribly boring, um, mind-numbingly boring from the life sciences. Uh, and then we're going to pick one of those, and then I am going to have 45 minutes to engaging with you, but also engaging with ChatGPT, make the topic interesting. What we are going to try to do here is to get an AI to speak human. We are going to try to get it to make the topic matter to us uh, emotionally, using um, emotional binaries, using vivid mental images, using... I can just never, like, I have a whole list of these right here, right? Um, uh, using stories, using riddles, using metaphors. Ah, oh, that's a pretty good list right there. Uh, trying to get this thing called a chat GPT to give us a life changing, it burns itself in your brain. You are a changed person forever after understanding of it. Because, you know, everyone's all like, oh no, the AIs, oh no, they're ruining education. They're so boring. Teachers don't use them. Teachers don't know how to use them. Ah. With a lot of really smart people, including some substackers that I particularly like, saying, yeah, this is garbage. Like, this is just like, this is, this is no replacement for actual, like, human stuff. And I agree with that. I just also happen to agree that ChatGPT, when it comes to, like, preparing a lesson and making the lesson awesome, um, is in a pinch as good as, like, any three, any three books you could name on it. It's so great. And that there's this way, the subtle art of using ChatGPT, where we can do that more easily. Okay, so great. Here's what I want you to do. Um, uh, those of you who are here, as opposed to those of you who are, I don't know, in the center of the earth right now, go ahead and start throwing out, again, I just need a better verb phrase for that. I do see some examples of um, l topics from the life sciences that people, that you have yourself found boring Here's our ChatGPT button. Why, look, it's my face superimposed kind of next to a ChatGPT thing. Let me just prompt ChatGPT to get some ideas from this. Oh, biostatistics and NATS. All of it that's not biochem. Because you like biochem a lot, River? That's that's fine. That's cool. Um, let me just, um, when we do life sciences, what are we talking about? Ooh, I should have hit record for that. When we talk about the life sciences, what are we talking about? Biology, zoology, botany, genetics, ecology, microbiology, and medicine. Cellular, the, the, from cells to ecosystems, growth, reproduction, evolution, behavior. Any other ones? Organic chemistry. Okay, great. What we usually find for this is that we, like, if we say, like, if we try to make organic chemistry interesting, it's too big. It's, 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 it's better to take one thing that you found particularly terrible in biochemistry. Uh, biochemistry or organic chemistry um, and um, and zoom in on that. There's an XKCD about this that we should talk about at some point. Uh, let me um, get some, some examples, some very specific examples for this. Give me some very specific examples of things in the life sciences that people typically find mind numbingly boring when they're studying it in high school or college. It's speech to text is second to none. I've started using it for writing just to, like to capture what I'm saying. Okay. Taxonomy, kingdom phylum class without context. <sighs> Dumb King Philip coughed. And what he coughed was genus species. That gives you all of them. That's not, that's too easy. Plant anatomy. Oh, the stinking xylem and the stinking phloem. Oh, man. And leaf morphology. Oh, the shapes of leaves. That is, we could, I mean, that would be maybe interesting. People memorize terms with that. That would be, that would be great. We have two minutes left before we do this. Ugh, the intricacies of glyco glycolysis. Glycolysis is where we take a glucose molecule and we break it up into other molecules. We actually just did a lesson on that in Science is Weird this week. The Krebs cycle. That's the one when the mitochondria, the ATP, I think. ATP reaction. I, I know I've learned this before. I didn't take any uh, biology classes in, in school. Um, my, oh, that's 
go. Oh, I almost swore there. I don't in classes. Mitosis and meiosis. My to oh, oh, it's so awful. Um, enzyme kinematics, analyzing graphs and equations related to enzyme activity and reaction rates. I'm going to say no to that one because I don't know. It doesn't, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's going to require us to have a bunch of graphs and equations that we're not going to be be easy for us to grab onto. Microbial, microbial di I can talk. Genetics has been a long day. Plasmids. I don't really understand plasmids. Transformation. I don't know what that means. Transduction. I think I know what that means, but that could be something. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium calculations and allele frequently changes. We could do that if we wanted. We could do that. Graphing predator prey dynamics or nutrient cycling and ecosystems. That's just obviously interesting, but I guess I guess so. Okay, so let's um uh, what I'm gonna do actually is I'm going to take a quick screenshot of these and then we're gonna add on anything that other people have done. Great, wonderful, and I am then going to where did that go? It's right over where is it? On my computer right now I have like a whole mess of different things that have that picture because I'm screen sharing to myself like 10 times from yesterday. Airdrop to King Friday the 13th. Bum, 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 bum. Great. I can actually throw that in here. Topics. So I've been taking so long with this. I'll also look at what other ones y'all have written on here. Oh, I see. Great. And we will also write on taxonomy rocks. Taxonomy is rubbish. We did taxonomy is the thing. We totally did tax. Sorry, in Science is Weird, we did taxonomy when we were talking about um, snails. We did a whole thing on Carolus Linnaeus and a whole thing on um, uh, cladistics. Krebs. Hi, Ernie. Boo to Krebs. Ooh, so that actually might be, okay, that might be, that might be kind of good. Okay, let me just knock off a couple of these, and then um, we can vote on the remainders. We're going to say no to enzyme kinematics. We're going to say no to... If we choose this one, we'll have to choose a specific one there. This is already too interesting. I'm going to cross out taxonomy. I'm good with any of the rest of these. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Go ahead and put a number in. What do you want to do? 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 Ah! No one has voted for anything. Okay. Let's be really clear about what's going on here, people. I'm going to hit that button again. And if you don't vote this next time, you don't get a vote. That's just the way it's going to be. Okay. And you mark, get set, and go. You have 10 seconds to make your guess. Or not your guess. Your thing. Keep that blank there so you can see it. All right, we are going with number one was the one that I crossed off! Four, we're gonna go with four, okay. We're gonna do, we're gonna do both meiosis and my toe. If we have to choose one of these, and I don't know if we do, we'll try to do both of them. If we have to, ah, they're different things. If we had to choose one of them, and we will, which one do you want? Mitosis or meiosis? You have 10 seconds, go. We just made origami mitosis. You know that you're talking with homeschoolers. <laughs> It's really cool. That's my way of saying it's really, really cool, right? I was going to say, like, when you go into somebody's house and you see a, a, a timeline, a, a handmade timeline on their wall, it's the typical way that you know somebody's a homeschooler. But Okay, meiosis, three to four, who loses? Sorry, River. It is meiosis, okay? Meiosis. All right, and now we say 45 minutes begin. You see that? It feels like we're in TV show. 
where they never paused for a long time to remember the name of the TV show. TV show. 24, 24. Oh, that's interesting that you can only kind of see it. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, great, wonderful. Except for the part that I'm sorry about. Oh, now you can see it. This is good. This is good. Okay, um, just to be really clear as to what we are going to be shooting for at the end of this, I'm going to be asking you, how much do you feel like you learned about meiosis? How emotional is it? And how much do we connect meiosis to life, the universe, and everything? Okay, so think about these, the L, the E, and the L. That's, we need a better metaphor, better mnemonic for that. Okay, cool. Let's start this. That's the wrong button. Act as a biologist and tell me what is the utter basic that I... Context! Uh, we here, science is weird and everything else that we are, practice the subtle art of eganizing things. Kieran Egan was a guy who came up with, I don't know, I'm just going to say, I, I, I think it's like the, it's not the one true way of education. It, it, it truly isn't. It is the closest that anybody has yet gotten <laughs> to the one true way. It's the way that makes everything make sense. It says that the human mind did not just pop into existence as a rational thing or as a simple, like, pleasure-seeking thing. We evolved all these capacities, all these modules, all these tools over the eons from bacterium on up to be able to deal well with our, uh, with our environments and uh, pass along our genes. If we understand this, we understand our strengths, our cognitive strengths, and then we can take these things and we can we can build our education, build our learning around it. So I'm thinking for meiosis, I'm going to want, first of all, I really am going to want like a simple definition of this. The definition is going to want to go back to metaphors um, to be really, really simple. I'm going to want to have a mental image of what this actually is looking like inside of a cell when the mitosis scene is happening. Um, and then um, I'm gonna want to maybe even have uh, a sense, like, like I'm sorry, I'm going to want to like imagine like what would this would feel like. So that's probably going to involve shrinking down to be, what would that be? Like a micrometer tall, like a micrometer tall. If you're a micrometer tall, depending on, sorry, do bacterium go through meiosis? They go through my, I do all, Animal cells go through? Wow, okay. So this is a good question for me. Wonderful. Um, is there anything else that I see in here that I really am going to want for this? I think I'm going to be interesting with my with my body, like how I can like move my hands in a way that actually gets at this sort of untangling of DNA, which is what happens in mitosis. Meiosis. Meiosis when two cells come together and have sex. Is that right? Oh my gosh, it's been such a long time. Um, I'm going to be interested in the emotional binaries that this has. When we identify that, everything is going to make this make more sense. I, I am interested in, I, I, I actually am interested in how meiosis exists in the whole evolution of the universe. I'm going to, I want, what are we trying to pull back kind of up into that? I feel like there's something about the strangeness of meiosis that we should try to highlight. Anything else here? I think that stories are not going to be a big, major part of it. Meta narratives, I don't think so. This is more of a tech, uh, technical sort of dealio. Listen collections, names. I might want to name some of the parts of this. Okay, rhythm is going to be an important part of this. Bizarre, bizarre details? Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay. So now I want to just start off with some really simple definitions of this. I'm going to just delete that. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. Act as a biologist. Please give me, I don't know, five different definitions of what meiosis is from the Absolute stupidest simplest to the mm, very complexest. The longest one, the final one should be, I don't know, maybe about 25 words long. 
Big money, big money, big money, big money, big money. Meiosis makes babies. Meiosis is how cells divide to make eggs and sperm. Meiosis splits one cell into four unique cells, each with half the DNA used in reproduction. I'm going to repeat that because now I'm getting to the point where I don't understand this easily. Meiosis splits one cell into four unique cells. I've seen pictures of this. Looks like a clover, a four leaf clover, each with half each with half the DNA. You think that doesn't make sense? Yeah, I think that's the sense that it makes. Used in reproduction. I don't really know what it means by using reproduction right now. I'm realizing that I can make this bigger for you to have an easier time reading this. But then I lose that. No, I don't. Sorry, just a second. I am still getting the hang of making this as easy as possible for you. There. Is that easier to read? I hope that is. Um, oh gosh, maybe I was just trying to dawdle from this. Meiosis is a two-step division process that creates gametes, which means sperm or egg, uh, reducing chromosome numbers, reducing, and ensuring genetic diversity through recombination and independent assortment. I don't know what a lot of those things mean. Ah, meiosis is a specialized form of cell division in eukaryotes that reduces chromosome numbers by half. What's weird is that there seems, okay, producing four genetically distinct haploid cells. Oh my gosh, I hate this. Through two successive divisions. Sometimes when I'm working with Amy or a science advisor, she'll kind of talk about this. I'm like, no, I just, it's just, ah, the numbers, they're not, ah, why, why is it like this? Okay, through two successive divisions. Panicked much? No. Are you? I'm fine. I just have 30 minutes to do this is all. Let's do some metaphors. Oh, that's the wrong button. Oh, that's the right button. Imagine that you're Richard Feynman and give me just a really compelling metaphor for the essential thing that happens in meiosis that gets at the genius of the whole process of meiosis. Imagine you've got two decks of cards, each representing all the genetic information you could possibly pass on. Now, instead of just shuffling one deck and handing it over, meiosis is like taking half from each deck and mixing them up in a way that no one's ever seen before. But here's the kicker. It's just such a chat GPT sort of sentence there. But here's the kicker. Or at least it's my chat GPT. During the shuffle, some of the cards swap sections. As if the king of hearts suddenly shares half its picture with the queen of spades. Are they chromosomes? What you're left with is a brand new, one-of-a-kind deck. Completely unpredictable, yet still playable. That's the magic of meiosis. Every generation gets a fresh, unpredictable hand. And that's how life keeps evolving, staying sharp and never getting stale. It's random but precise, chaotic yet ordered, a master stroke of nature's design. Mm. How well does that do for you? I feel like that's like, eh. I think we can do better by, or at least make it clear here, by having it put, oh, I'll just say it. Okay, so now put into a table all of the pieces of that metaphor on one side, and then in the next column, all of the, um, the things that they actually are referring to. Two decks of cards are two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent. Oh boy, this is, why is life so complicated? Shuffling the decks, random assortment of chromosomes during meiosis. One. Oh my gosh, because there's these rep repetitions. Taking half from each step. Reduction of chromosomes number deployed to half. Nope, can't do it. 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 This is great. This is great. You are now seeing the dark recesses of my scientific soul. There are just these things that I, I, I suck at. Okay. I'm just trying to think how can we go more Egan with this? So I think the thing that I'm struggling with right now is that this is all just so flipping abstract. 
And in some ways, going with the metaphor does not make it less abstract. It just puts on another layer of abstraction to it. And that thing about the cards and the changing whatever, it's like, wait, what are we even talking about? <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? That's a bad metaphor. If, if a person tells you that metaphor, I think you should, like, kick their chair over. One of the things that Egan is really big on is that it is easier to understand details inside of their big context. I'm going to go for the biggest context of all, evolution of life, the universe, and everything. <sighs> Tell me when the very first meiosis happened, what was the sort of organism that it happened in? How, that's enough. The first meiosis likely happened in early single-cell eukaryotes, so not bacteriums at this point, but eukaryotes, uh, animals, plants, that fungus, about mm, two billion years ago. These organisms were simple, likely re resembling modern proteists like a amoeba or algae, which it turns out is not a plant. Who knew? I did as of last week. Meiosis probably evolved from mitosis as a way to increase genetic diversity. There's a story here which gave these early organisms an advantage in adapting to changing environments. Okay, so do you see what we just did? <sighs> when I tell people, like, oh, I think you should, like, put that thing into a story, I feel like what they hear is, like, mm, like Magic Treehouse. And I'm not dissing Magic Treehouse by any means. Magic Treehouse can be... I mean, I regret that we didn't use more Magic Treehouse with, my, with our kids, and we actually used a lot of it with our daughter. Um... But they think like these cheap, chintzy little things. No. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Stories are golden and beautiful creatures that need to be respected. They are the unicorns of learning. Somebody write that down, please. Um, I'm beginning to understand that meiosis is not just this terrible thing invented in the dark hells of satanic textbook mills, but rather was a solution to a terrible problem. Great. <laughs> we can work with this. I want you to imagine that meiosis is the solution to a terrible problem. I want you to keep your old skills, but add on the skills of a simple storyteller who uses emotional binaries to tell stories of, that help us understand the evolution of life. Tell me what was going on in little organisms before meiosis existed. Talk a lot about the problem that they had. And actually pause at that point. Don't tell me how it was solved. We'll see how well this goes. Before meiosis, life was stuck, stuck in a frustrating cycle. Imagine a world where simple organisms, tiny single-celled beings, are trying to survive. They could only make copies of themselves through mitosis, a process where one cell splits into two identical copies. Cloning. Duplication. At first, this was fine. Everyone looked the same, acted the same, and passed in the same traits. It was like a world filled with clones. But here's the problem. How much better is this for you right now? I'm actually, like... I don't, I'm not trying to pay attention. It's easy. The world is unpredictable. Environments changed, new challenges appeared, heat, cold, predators, new diseases. The problem wasn't that these organisms couldn't re reduce, reproduce. They could endlessly. The problem was that they were trapped in their sameness. Oh my gosh, this is actually beautiful. If something came along that one of them couldn't survive, it meant all of them were doomed. No variety. No new ideas, no way to evolve to get better, stronger, smarter. It was like they were stuck in a tiny box. Every time one split into two, it just made another clone inside the same box. That's not a good metaphor. They had no way out, no way to adapt. Wow. Okay, I think I'm just ready to hear what the explanation is. Okay, tell me... In really simple terms, what the change was from mitosis to meiosis, from cloning to this thing. 
as part of it. No, that's enough. And that would be enough. And that could be enough. The change from meiosis to mitosis to meiosis was like breaking out of that box. Instead of just making exact copies, mitosis mixed things up. It created new cells that weren't clones, but each a little different. By shuffling the genetic deck, organisms can now produce offspring with unique combinations of traits, giving them a better chance to survive and adapt. It was no longer just about survival in the moment. It was about creating diversity for the future. This is not helpful. This is not what I want because the parts of this are the, the hard parts of this, the phases. Okay, so now I understand. Right? This is like what we talk about usually when we talk about the evolution of sex. Uh, the sexual reproduction, right? The, why is it useful to do this? Even though even each individual animal like would actually want to pass on all of its genes, why don't we all just clone ourselves? Because it is a way of out-competing, um, uh, going into new environments. Oftentimes it's um, out-competing um, viruses, which, are, which evolve obviously really quickly. Um, but now I need to understand the actual phases of this. I'm going to steer toward the tool of naming for this. Okay, I want you to list out in a table the steps of mitosis. In one column, give the simple name. In the next column, give a metaphor for what is going on right there. In the next column, give me the etymological breakdown of where the official name for that phase comes from. And then in the final column, give me a one-sentence explanation written at the level of a fifth grader. There's one other thing I, I thought to add here. Mental images would be helpful here. Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, also, I forget that tables, it doesn't do tables as well as it used to. I think go in here. Oh, what is going, why is it so stupid life? Okay, pro phase, setting the stage like actors getting ready for a play. Meta phase, lining up for a race, everyone getting to the starting line. Anaphase, tug of war where the rope chromosomes is pulled apart. See, I need to imagine what the chromosomes, I mean, I, I know something about chromosomes, right? I just got my, my full genome res results. They're in the email right now. I, I, I saw them that they're, they're, they're finally done this morning. Um, I want to know, I want to be able to visualize like what chromosome, what gene is on, what part of it, right? Like I feel like all genetics is done just this really abstract way that I, it's just really hard for me. Um, I feel like these are mixed metaphors here. Telephase, clean up after the race, putting everything back in order. Uh, cytokinesis, the curtain falls, dividing the stage in two. Okay. That's kind of terrible because we have all of these. Is it actors? And now it's actors again. But now it's a race. But now it's a tug of war. And now it's a race again. Pro, the before stage, the middle stage. Meta can mean a lot of things. Maybe it can mean middle. Anna does mean again, the Anna stage, Anna phase. Uh, tello means the end phase, and cyto means the cell. Hmm, it's one that ends with kinesis. Oh, so the cells move away from each other. The cell gets ready for division by organizing its parts. Chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell, ready to split. This is nice, this is nice. The chromosomes are pulled to opposite sides of the cell. The cell starts to form two new cells with everything in its place. The cell fully splits into two separate cells. This is mitosis. This is mitosis. This is cloning. Okay, good. What animals use both mitosis and meiosis? I feel like the answer is humans and we use the meiosis for our, to make eggs and sperm cells, but why? Okay, okay, okay. All right, that's what I thought. Okay, I just wanted to know what kind of animal should I imagine? Oh, but we also like, um, I'm realizing it's hard for me to hold in my head both Imagining like a human, this being true, but also imagining like a, not a bacterium, but like a little, um, an amoeba, right? Amoebas are nice. Everyone likes amoebas. 
except when they get stuck in your brain. Then nobody likes amoebas. Um, we should, I should just focus on one thing. So I'm going to focus on amoebas here. <clears throat> and can amoebas both use, well, both use mitosis and meiosis? Likely in response to environmental stress, this allows them to create genetic diversity, enhancing their ability to survive changing conditions. So while mitosis, the main method of cloning, is the main one, mitosis gives them a backup strategy for adaptation. And you're seeing right now that, like, I like thinking this is cloning because I can make sense of that. But human cells also use it. We just don't call it cloning when your cells do it. We call it mitosis. But we could just call it cloning. Is that true? We'll find out. Could one just call mitosis cloning, even when it occurs in multicellular life? Does that basically get at the essence of what's going on? Okay, I'll go with it. Where are we? We're at the part where we actually massage our temples. We have 23 minutes left, okay! Um... I want to understand the difference between mitosis and meiosis. I want to understand specifically how this looks different. I think I want to set this in the story of like the very first amoeba. What should their name be? Ami. Ami the amoeba. I want you to tell the story of Ami the amoeba, who is back in time, the first amoeba to ever be able to use meiosis and not just mitosis. Give us some sense of how this amoeba was different than others that allowed it to do this. This is one of the reasons that I'm so big on teaching evolution in part of biology, because when you teach evolution, without evolution, you have no story. You are giving up the most powerful unicorn-like tool that, uh, that we have for, um, for learning. Why? Why would we do such a thing? That's dumb. It's too long. Make that story shorter. I know you can't see it. I just don't want to read the whole thing to you. <laughs> long ago, Amy, the amoeba, watched as her fellow amoebas, all perfect clones, struggled and died when the environment changed. Unlike them, Ami, Ami, had a rare, rare trick, the ability to mix and shuffle her DNA. She could do that herself? Producing unique offspring. Really? I'm gonna call crap on that. When times got tough, Amy used this new power, creating cells that weren't copies but different, each better adapted to survive. This shuffle ability, meiosis, meant her descendants could thrive in a changing world, setting the stage for life's endless diversity. But you said that meiosis was sex. Sex requires two. You only have one amoeba in the story. What's going on? You see how clueless I am right now? And you can, but you can be clueless, ChatGP, ChatGPT. It doesn't mind. It's not sentient. Great catch! Oh, now this is very interesting. In fact, early meiosis likely started as a kind of pre-sex strategy for, symbols, for single organisms. For Aami, this would mean using meiosis-like processes to shuffle her own DNA even without another partner. This allowed her to make genetically varied cells without cloning, a huge advantage in changing environments. The two-partner version, version of meiosis we now think of as sexual reproduction where two cells fusion stop DNA evolved later. Ami's case would have been a transitional form, a solo attempt at genetic mixing that eventually paved the way for true sex involving two organisms. So in Ami's time, she was simply pioneering the mechanisms, mechanics that would one day become a full-blown sexual reproduction. I have never understood this, and I've always, I've always been confused about this, and I really feel like this is actually some of what is behind why meiosis was so confusing to me. It's because there's actually two cool, two, you know, this one weird trick but there's two of them <laughs> that are overlapping with this. And isn't it nice to, to, figure out, to figure out that they're different? Okay, 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 
I think I need to have a vivid mental image in my head, as opposed to where exactly, um, uh, about how this looks. So I guess I'm going to actually do the same um, thing my jigger that I did before, the same table that I did before for this. Make me another table that is the same format as the one that you made me for mitosis, but now for meiosis. And after and before it, tell me, highlight what the differences are between these. I could have done that as separate steps. Maybe I should have. I'll highlight the, highlight the differences afterwards. Yeah. I um, I wonder actually sometimes if you have it do it afterwards, does it do it better? Does it then like sort of is it able to like search and think about all of the things that it said, the simpler things that it said? <sighs> Holy mother of God! What? Why? Why? That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> Why is this the worst thing that anyone has ever been forced to learn? But when you do the wonder, then you want to learn it. I'll shut up and keep talking. Um, oh my God. Oh. Okay. Okay. I don't want to even do the scrolling. Give me the same thing, but uh, take out the etymology column. Call them, not call them. That's, well, but it did what I wanted to do, so that's good. Oh my God, why, 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 why? I'm just trying to see prophase one, prophase two, metaphase one, metaphase two, anaphase one, anaphase two, telophase one, telophase two. They move apart. The divorce. Okay. Um, meeting place where two decks of cards are shuffled. Chromosomes pair up and exchange pieces to mix DNA. So they pair up. The chromosomes, because we're not talking about two different cells yet. Because we're not talking about two different cells yet. Hmm. Are we or are we not? We're not clear about that. It's going to have this big corpus of data to talk about general stuff, but I want to imagine what that original stuff, uh, the original um, pre-sex meiosis was like. Make the same table, but this time make it just for what the pre-sex meiosis of the character Amy would have been like. Go ahead and tell me, if you're guessing it, what those are like, tell me when you're guessing, but still go ahead and guess. So it's still going to have these. I'm honestly wondering if this is a good time to change this. Because we're actually moving into what might be theoretical um, genetics here. Uh, evolutionary genetics. Evolutionary microbiology. I'm going to go and choose one of the thinking ones. I'm going to do mini. Give me that table again. Make sure that you keep everything nice and short. These models, the thinking models, have a tendency to just make everything, I don't know, five times longer than it needs to be. I don't think I'm exaggerating there. It's pretty bad. Thought for a few seconds. I didn't think for very long. It also got rid of the regular names for these. I'm just gonna look at this first. Single shuffle, unlocked modern meiosis. Amy's process involved involves shuffling within one cell. Two splits, Amy's meiosis has two division steps, resulting in four unique cells. Okay, divides in two, divides in two, instead of dividing right into four. Mixing, early meiosis focus on mixing traits without needing two parents. So we start with one cell and we're gonna end up with with four cells. Why, if we're starting with one cell, do we end up with four cells? Wouldn't two suffice? I'm, I'm feeling like I'm lost right now.
See, this is the whole, let me give you a term paper. But I mean for our hypothetical ami the amoeba, why would it still go to four cells? And please be short in your answer and in all subsequent answers in this conversation. I do feel like I'm in Star Trek right now. Mm, for Amy the amoeba, producing four cells through meiosis allows each new cell to have a unique mix of genes. Yeah, but who would do that too? This increases genetic diversity, helping her offspring better survive different challenges. Even without another parent, making four varied cells gives Amy's lineage a stronger chance to adapt and thrive. But splitting to two and then each of those splitting to two would do it just the same. So that seems weird to me. Okay, this is not does not seem to be a productive line of reasoning. Um, with limited time, I want to go to... The major difference is this, this thing where it chooses the genes. It, it, I don't understand what that means. So maybe I should look up this table right now that I had to make. Shuffle start, quite shuffling the decks of cards, loose lineup, players line up loosely for the game, soft talking of rope, neighbors sharing parts of a deck, brief reshuffle before next split, players line up quickly for another round, last gentle tug of rope, cutting the deck into unique hands, creating new unique decks. Part of the trouble with this is that, like, if you look at a picture of, um, I'm going to cheat. I should make part of, as part of this game, that I actually get to cheat, like, let's say, once per, yes, good, so this isn't even cheating, this is great. I want to get one of those uh, pictures that has DNA, chromosomes, um, et cetera. I want a picture of this. Yeah, I want something like this. It's even fine if it's uh, German. That's fine. That's fine. It's basically the same words. Okay, so we need this to kind of understand what's going on. But then there's a bunch of these, these chromosomes, right? Okay. But how many of these are actually going to exist for uh, Amy? How many chromosomes do amoebas have? Getting specific on this is going to be very helpful. Oh, I probably want to switch it back to uh, not the mini, but the whatever. Holy God! What? Why? That's the stupidest thing ever! They have too many. They have too many chromosomes. They have too many chromosomes. Stupid. Stupid. Why in the name of all that is holy did they have that many chromosomes? Way more than people do. I'm just curious. Asking for a friend. Because it's a random number and it doesn't, you don't get more chromosomes if you are um, whatever. Oh, okay, so you can have a bunch of small ones. Okay, so chromosomes are knots, right? These big knots of thread that are themselves kind of wand around, right? So the thread kind of goes like this. They're running these balls or whatever. But anyway, they, um, they then get uh, wound together into these, these big knots. Okay, so a chromosome is a knot. And the problem is going to be something like, you know, how do you... Untie the knot because you need to get those. Okay, so the problem, right, is that you have to, the, the, the DNA is like going to then like break apart and, um, and then to make a new thing of the DNA because this is all about duplicating your DNA, right? This is all about duplicating your DNA, and so you need to unfurl it. But that's also true in my, meiosis. I'm just going to check this for a second. And I am going to go back to this because this is a pretty simple question. In both mitosis and meiosis, the essential problem is how do you unfurl the giant complex knot of DNA in order to uh, make a copy of it, right? Okay. I want to get even more specific about like, how this actually happens. So let me ask this. And when one strand of DNA is pulled apart then another strand will actually just sort of randomly congeal, well, congeal from the chaos of the floating nucleotides that are bopping around the nucleus of the cell. Is that correct? Okay. 
Okay. That's actually really cool, right? Just like, imagine, you know, like, you take yourself and, like, you just you pull yourself in half. Like half a head here, half a head here. And then, you know, just like out of, like, the, the oxygen molecules and methane, whatever the heck this is. Smell good. What is that? It's a sulfur. Oh, jeez. Terrible. Um, whatever is hanging around in the air here. You do not probably have sugar molecules hanging around in the air here. Uh, you, uh, you just, like, materialize a new head. That would be neat. Happy Halloween, everybody, next week. We still will be doing this next week, even though it's Halloween. We could do a Halloween-themed one if we wanted to do that. That might be fun. Um, okay, so that's good to know. I think the essential thing that I don't still understand is many things, but I think the one I want to focus on right now is how we don't have... I don't understand what's going on with the, um, the choosing the DNA. Because I've never really split this apart from understanding sexual reproduction. How does Amy, the amoeba, choose some of her DNA to be copied? How does she shuffle it inside of herself? Amy's DNA shuffling happens to a primitive version of crossing over. Instead of copying all of her DNA exactly, Amy's... Uh, I think there's like 10 different ways of pronouncing this, and I've tried all of them. Amy's cell machinery would align pairs of chromosomes closely. Oh. Oh, my gosh. Allowing sections to swap between them. This crossing over means some DNA chunks are exchanged, creating unique combinations. The choice is unconscious. It's guided by enzymes that help break and align and break chromosomes at specific points, align segments straight places. So Ami doesn't choose the DNA to shuffle consciously. It's more like an internal organized mixing driven by cellular mechanics. The shuffle DNA mix then gets passed to our offspring, ensuring they're not clones but carried very traits. But carried very traits. Uh, I just want to fine tune what this is. Um, uh, what this is uh, saying that I understand what's it's saying here. So you're basically saying that it squeezes all the chromosomes super close together, so that randomly some of the DNA in one of them happens to jump onto the spots of the knot of the of the second one. Is that right? And this can happen accidentally, even in mitosis, right? Can you give some examples of that if that's true? I'm thinking of one in particular. Huh. Things that I'm getting not particularly interesting here. I'm thinking of one where you can have um, the one gene that makes you uh, male jump off the Y chromosome and onto one of the X, one of the other, sorry, one on, one of the other, one of the other chromosomes, and then you end up having a male body even though you don't have a Y chromosome, which kind of is a fun complication of our idea of Y chromo the Y chromosome does it, the SRY gene, I think. Um, okay, sorry. Um, okay. And then this that is used inside of, hold on for a second. Is this basically saying that Amy, the amoeba, causes herself to mutate and makes mutant clones? I feel like that's going to be not quite right. Yes, in a way, it kind of is. It's variations. Is there a major difference between uh, having your genes swap places with one another as opposed to having just random changes happen inside of your nucleotides, for example, is caused by radiation? Or are they basically the same thing? Is, for example, the sort that has happened in this early meiosis safer than random mutations? The screen just flashed. Did you see that? The screen just flashed because you have five minutes left. Holy crap! I do not know that this is going to work! Yeah, I, I'm learning a lot. It's kind of neat. Yes, and a, Oh, sorry, I didn't hit the go button. Go, go, go! Yes, there's a major difference between gene swapping, recombination through meiosis, and random mutations caused by things radiation. I've never really understood this before. The changes are controlled and specific. They're not controlled. Eh, yeah, kind of. 
cr- in meiosis, when genes cross over, they they're controlled and specific. They preserve functional DNA, so they don't screw up genes and make they don't break genes. This process includes, increases genetic diversity while keeping most genetic information intact. It's a safer, safer form of variation because it usually happens in non-critical areas of DNA. Interesting. Maintaining, maintaining important gene computations. Random mutations occur to the nucleotide level, um, which I think means the this, what, every three of those is a nucleotide? Am I right about that? This is, again, like genetics is like the major hole in my biological knowledge or something because each one of those is called a codon, I think. Okay, okay. Okay, so now I need to figure out what the connection is between this and, um, what am I saying? And, um, and sexual um, reproduction is with, I don't know, like three minutes or something like that. Okay, so now I imagine that there is a, um, another, no, excuse me, when, what was the first organism for which uh, sexual reproduction is thought to have happened? Single cell karyotes, eukaryotes, sorry, I tried to talk. Similar to amoebas again. Okay, so we're still talking in amoeba. Um, we're going to call him Zach because we're actually going to have um, sex now, right? So, uh, male and female for this um, before I always go with vaguely feminine names. Um, uh, once again, act as a storyteller and tell me a simple story about Zach, the amoeba-like critter who was the first to not only have that early form of meiosis, but also have sexual meiosis and reproduce sexually. Tell me, what was the problem in the world of meiosis having amoebas before Zach, and what was the thing that made Zach different that allowed him to have the first sex? That got interesting. Congratulations, Zach. And a lot of time long ago, yeah, 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 yeah. I want this, Zach. I want this shorter. Bloobity, 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 bloob. Tell me that a lot shorter, please. In a world of amoeba like critters that only shuffle their DNA through meiosis, Zach was different. Instead of relying solely on his own genetic material, Zach had the ability to combine his DNAs with another's. Our DNAs combined! This first sexual reproduction meant that Zach's offspring had traits from two parents, creating a brand new level of genetic diversity. His offspring were stronger and better adapted, marking the beginning of sex and changing the course of life forever. What was his secret? He should have written a book! What was Zach's secret? What actually made him different? Give me some guesses that biologists have. Please, please, I beg you. I don't think that's actually going to. I'm actually not sure if that maybe does make a difference for ChatGPT. Zach's secret involved, likely involves several key evolutionary steps. Here are some biological guesses. Okay, so we're on the realm of guesswork here. Cell fusion ability. Zach's cells developed the ability to fuse with another cell, combining the genetic material. This fusion, a precursor to gamete fusion, allowed the exchange of DNA between two individuals rather than shuffling between one. Okay, okay, so their outer cells are, are different. Specialized gametes. What does that mean? It means the egg or sperm cell, but he is a cell, so that doesn't make sense. He may have evolved haploid gametes. He is a... Okay, so what? How does that even... Reco- Number three, recombination control. His meiosis likely had more precise control over recombination, where chromosome segments were swapped. This allowed more reliable, intentional genetic mixing between two cells, not just within one. Doesn't make any sense at all to me. Recognition of other cells. So Zach's cells may have developed the, ab- developed the ability to recognize other cells as comp- compatible partners for fusion. This could have involved specific proteins or receptors that enabled Zach's cell to identify with another complementary DNA. Cells ordinarily have the ability to recognize other cells. That is a thing that bacteriums even have. Um, quorum sensing and what have you, if you've been part of our science's weird lessons on that. Um, so this would just be kind of the same thing, just a, basically the same thing. That That's not very different, but okay. Did the timer run out? The timer ran out, didn't it? We're we're done. 
What was the original question? <laughs> According to what I wrote down, it was... Explain meiosis and the stages. I feel like I... I feel like... Here, I'll say, I'll say no more. I'll say no more. It's time for the judgment. It's apportioned for me to do this once, and then the judgment. If anyone knows who I'm quoting there, extra props. Okay, I will take your votes right now. How much do you feel like you learned about this? Zero means nothing at all. Five means holy crap. And you can go higher. You can do a six if you want. I'll give you 10 seconds. Go ahead and do this. All right, the average is three. Okay, okay. How emotional, I need an exact wording for this. How much do you feel like your emotions were triggered, were pulled at, not by me yelling, hopefully I didn't scare you, but how much do you feel like they were, your emotions were brought at with um, this learning of this, of this thing that we were doing? 10 seconds, go for it. Averages, three. Oh, oops. just get a big one there. Oof. I think I agree particularly with that one. How much did we connect this to life, the universe, and everything? I suppose the, we should be clear, right? Compared to, for all of these, right? It's compared to, I don't know, an hour of studying in a textbook, I guess is maybe the natural thing here. Anyway, 10 seconds and go for it. All right, the average there is five. Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, I'll stick around for a minute. Was that a fail? Was that a success? I will just reflect that for me, I definitely understand. The reason that I reacted so strongly um, about seeing meiosis and mitosis at the beginning of this is that the only real experience I've had with these was when I was uh, fresh out of college and I put, um, I, had, I had majored in world religions, religious studies, and, um, and history. And uh, the history one, I stacked on an extra and super expensive fifth year uh, because I thought that the history degree would be the useful one. I may have been the first person in the history of the academy to think that a history degree would be useful. I chose it specifically because I thought it would be useful. <laughs> anyway, what does one do with this? The answer is one tutors. And uh, what does one tutor? Anything, just anything that one can get. And uh, I remember working with a young woman in um, Phoenix who, uh, you know, was, oh man, she always referred to me as tutor. Her mom would call and be like, can't talk right now, I'm talking to tutor. Just like, that was a name. It was very strange. She, um, uh, she, one week she came to me, it was just like you know, this kind of grab bag, right? This math thing, this English thing, this whatever thing. One week it was mitosis or meiosis or both of them or something. And there's all these like little, these, uh, little, um, uh, diagrams. And, um, I had to help her learn these. And I knew a little bit about learning theory at the time, kind of like ordinary sort of traditionalist cognitive, you know, good stuff, right? Like you should, um. And you should like repeat things and you should like ask the why and you should ask how and you should, I don't know. It's, I, I, it's hard for me to, to go back that far in my head, but like these kinds of things. And like for an hour and a half, we beat these things into her head where she had to explain it. I pretended to be a kid, right? And she'd explain it to me. Um, she could talk about maybe the difference, I'm guessing, between like these things and like the anaphase. And the, 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 at the end of it, it worked. And I, I will tell you, I have... At that point, up until that point of my life, I'd never been more excited about helping somebody learn anything before as her really learning and really getting these, like knowing that she would likely go into her test the next day and get a very nice score, probably her highest score ever on, this, on any test in this class.
she, she, she and I could have both passed that test with flying colors. I interested nothing of any of it. What are these things? What, why did they exist? What are these organisms? Why do they have these things? What were the problems that these organisms were having? We actually had the visuals down, which was something that was hard to do with ChatGPT, right? Because it doesn't do visuals. It can through Dolly, but they're not, they're not like diagrams like this. Someday, yes, but not now. Um, we had the diagrams. We could kind of make sense of them if we looked at them carefully, but it was crap. It was just fake learning. For me, in that situation, how much I learned here compared to there, oh, like, I don't know, like maybe maybe it would have been a four as opposed to like, if I, if I called that a five, where I would have been able to tell you all the dang details, like maybe that would have been a five. And this would have, today was only, would have been a four. But with the emotions, like, okay, compared to what we usually do, like the only emotions there are pain, the pain of not getting it and the pleasure of being able to repeat something. This was so much more emotional because we we're actually understanding like this through the perspective of these actual organisms that literally existed. Zach was a real dude. He was the first real dude. He was, he was just the first dude. He was the dude for a moment <laughs> in evolutionary history. Um, and how is it to connect to life, the universe, and everything compared to what people usually do? Well, um, it did. <laughs> For example, compared to, it connected to nothing. It connected to a, a very small fraction of one's ultimate GPA, right? Um, yeah. If I had this to do over, I feel like I would... Sorry, any questions anybody wants to ask about this? Feel free to throw these in. Um... I am, um, if I had this to do over, I think I as efficiently as I was personally able to move through these. If I had 10 more minutes, I think that what I'd like to do is get a vivid mental image for some of these phases and understand why these phases then repeat themselves. That would have been good. And when I say a vivid mental image, I mean like shrink down to be like one micron tall. Um, Bacterium is oftentimes like two microns long. Looks like a sausage. Um, they can be a lot, a lot, a lot bigger, um, but they're usually aboutish that size. Um, eukaryotic cells, like an amoeba, can get terrifyingly large. Um, uh, so imagine, I guess, that I'm maybe one micron. That would allow me to do DNA strands would be like this long if I was one micron tall. So like the, the thread would go on for, you know, I don't know, kilometers, miles, many hundreds of miles maybe at that stage. But um, yeah, so I'd like to actually imagine that mesh and how, you know, it's like it's jiggling, it's vibrating. Eukaryotes are the ones where you have the nucleus, right, which is like the bag inside of the bag of the cell. And I've always understood that the reason for that is so they can protect their DNA, protect their knots of chromosomes. But I wonder if part of it also is just so when uh, that you care because those are the only ones that can do a real kind of sex. Um, so maybe it's that is part of it that you actually needed to have that bag. So then you can have a, a double jumble <laughs> that comes in there and, uh, and have those things connect up carefully or uncarefully. So I'd be interested to learn the, the, the relationship that the, um, that the bag, the nucleus has with this. Um, what else? That's, that's maybe what I'd, what I'd most like. What's interesting there is that I feel like in order to kind of move toward a, a, the understanding that I'd want, if I had some extra time, I would not jump to, still <laughs> would not jump to, uh, doing the dang school thing of like memorizing the telophase and anaphase and connect these pictures to here. Ugh, just the worst, right? It's just like, let's take like, let's take the, everything that we know. Let's like kill it. <laughs> let's press it into a book. Let's take its like desiccated two dimensional carcass and let's have kids memorize that. It's like, 
then take like a grainy black and white Xerox of that and have kids like memorize, like label that. Like that is the thing that we're studying, but like the animal is dead. It's dead, Jim. Why don't people talking about this more? <laughs> I still am not wanting to go to this dead Xerox of the thing that we're studying. Instead, to really understand this, what I find myself doing is wanting to connect it still more with um, with the other aspects of the evolution of life, like the evolution of the nucleus in eukaryotic cells. Okay. Magic school bus. Magic school bus. Uh, I'm going to go. My one realization from today, and I'll just say this out loud so it gets out somewhere. I'm going to be held responsible for this. I feel like the insight that I had is that One natural audience for hearing these sorts of things will be or would be um, people who are studying these things in high school, in college. And I feel like we actually might be able to get a lot of utility out in the world of like, how do you study these things, these classic things that are so boring? I like that because it brings in like all of my experience as a tutor and as a self-learner. Um, yeah. Oh, also, hopefully starting next week, we will have moved this to YouTube. Nope. Yes, 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 yes. To YouTube Live. So there will be a very low bar for entry for this. So thank you for coming. Thanks for watching this. You know, whatever. Bye. Toodles. <laughs>